Hello dears. Somehow we have reached the middle of November and Thanksgiving is one week away. Lately, I feel like the mouse that turned cream into butter from the story and catch me if you can. <laughs> Work is simply piling up and never ending a monster of my own creation. So I'm sorry, I did not end up recording any clips chatting to the camera with you this week. Instead, I have some cozy scenes, so please let me know which version you like better for future videos. While winter has not officially arrived with its bitter temperatures, the garden has prepared itself for its winter nap. We are busy harvesting some of the seeds and we generally leave behind the little plant skeletons as they are habitats for insects to overwinter on. In today's video, I have some historically inspired Thanksgiving recipes to share with you. A molasses and brown sugar turkey, sage, sausage, and apple stuffing, and potato dinner rolls. I hope you enjoy them. First, we will be making a sage, sausage, and apple stuffing side dish. Growing up, I never liked stuffing. I had only ever had the kind from a box, and the flavor and texture grossed me out. I was in my early 20s the first time I tried making homemade stuffing, and it opened my eyes to what I had been missing. Historically, it was only within the last 150 years that we have been eating stuffing cooked entirely separate from the turkey itself. To make this recipe, you will need one loaf of day-old French bread. You'll cut that up into two inch cubes and place them into a lightly greased nine by 13 inch baking dish. Toss the cubed bread with two tablespoons of olive oil and bake in a 350 degree oven for about 15 to 20 minutes or until lightly toasted. While the bread is toasting, begin cooking the other ingredients. You'll need one pound of mild pork sausage, one medium onion, two cups of ground mushrooms, two cloves of garlic, one large apple, fresh sage and thyme, three eggs, one cup of apple cider, and two cups of chicken broth. Melt three tablespoons of butter over medium heat and cook the sausage until browned. Then add the mushrooms, cooking until browned and they begin to emit juices of their own, which takes about five to seven minutes. Then add in the onion, garlic, apple, and herbs. Season with salt and pepper to your taste. The eggs are beaten before adding to the casserole. Then add the eggs, apple cider, and broth, tossing gently to combine. The stuffing is baked for about 30 to 35 minutes. For 
for today's episode. I did not do much historical recipe research as I have been busy working on our winter journal and the second volume of our Christmas cookie box ebook. However, if you remember in our last episode, the recipe I followed for roasting our chicken was actually for roasting a turkey. While this isn't the historical Thanksgiving episode I was hoping to share this week, I did look into how the holiday of Thanksgiving came to be. Many people assume that Americans have been celebrating this holiday since the first Thanksgiving between the Pilgrims and American Indians. However, this was not necessarily the case. While some Americans celebrated an annual Thanksgiving meal, generally on the last Thursday of November, it was not a tradition nor was it a national holiday until 1863. President Abraham Lincoln shared a proclamation in the midst of the American Civil War that Thanksgiving would be celebrated as a national holiday. We can owe the inclusion of this celebration to Sarah Josepha Hale, a magazine editor and prolific writer from New Hampshire. This woman was incredibly dedicated. Growing up, Sarah's family had celebrated an annual Thanksgiving. She had a rather remarkable career in spite of the time period. She is the author of the children's poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb, helped found the American Ladies Magazine, and became the editor of Godey's Lady Book, which she used as a platform to share her passion for the holiday. Each year, she would write editorials for the magazine to influence others to celebrate Thanksgiving. I was honestly in awe at how long she attempted to sway state and federal officials to pass legislation making the last Thursday of November a national day of thanks. She did this for 36 years. It was the Civil War, with the country needing a way to unify the North and South, that led to the holiday, and this earned her the nickname, the Mother of Thanksgiving. I decided to focus my attention on the flavors and themes from the traditional meal served during this time period, mostly because I'm incredibly predictable. Each of these recipes is featured on my blog. To make the turkey, I decided to play around with some flavors that are commonly seen throughout early American cooking, molasses, nutmeg, and apples. I made a rub of salt, sage, nutmeg, and freshly ground pepper. Inside of the turkey, rather than a bread stuffing, you will be stuffing the bird with a roughly chopped onion, a whole head of peeled garlic, and an orange. You will want to poke the orange all over with the tines of a fork. Remove the neck and giblets from inside of the turkey and place them in the bottom of your roasting pan. This will add flavor to the drippings to make gravy. To truss the turkey, break the wing tips and tuck them underneath the body. If you are squeamish, I apologize, but to make a truly delicious flavored turkey, you will need to run your hands underneath the skin and separate the thin membrane that attaches the skin to the muscle on the breast and legs. The rub will go all over the outside of the turkey, in the cavity, and underneath the skin. For extra juiciness and flavor, pour one cup of bourbon into the roasting pan and one cup of apple cider. Next, you will heat one cup of molasses, two tablespoons of honey, a half cup of brown sugar, one tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, a half cup of butter, 
and the zest and juice of one orange. Bring this to a boil and then remove from heat. Before basting, finish trussing the turkey by tying the legs together. This will hold the moisture in. Then baste the turkey with about a third of the molasses mixture. This is not very aesthetic, but the turkey is then tended with foil and roasted at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 13 minutes per pound. This was an almost 13 pound turkey, so I roasted it for 2 hours and 45 minutes before the basting process began. The next recipe comes from my cookbook. I'll be turning my potato bread recipe into dinner rolls. You will need one medium baking potato. Cover this with one and a half cups water and bring it to a boil over the stove. Simmer the potatoes for about 10 to 12 minutes or until they are fork tender. To a large bowl, add two cups of flour and two tablespoons of active dry yeast. Mash the potatoes up until they are mostly smooth, then add 3 tablespoons of butter, 1 cup milk, 3 tablespoons of sugar, and 2 teaspoons of salt. Once this has cooled down a bit, add it to the flour and yeast and mix until the flour has been mostly soaked up. This is not in the book recipe, but I decided to add an egg for more flavor. Begin adding the remaining flour about 4 more cups. What was traditionally served at Thanksgiving in the 19th century? Really, the supper we eat today is fashioned quite similarly to what was served then. The Victorians would not be surprised to find stuffing, white bread, apple and pumpkin pies, sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, and turkey on their table. Other popular choices for side dishes during the time period were coleslaw, oysters, chicken pie, which would have been a cold meat pie encased in pastry, tomato or mushroom catsup, pickles, and stewed prunes. While these foods are not necessarily served today, they make sense for the time period. November, across much of the northern United States where Thanksgiving was most popular, was at the end of their harvest season. Even today, on our little homestead in Iowa, there is not much available that is fresh from the garden for eating. Everything has died back and is finished, which means our meals are going to heavily rely on what we have grown and preserved from the summer and early autumn days. While the dough rises, it's time to start basting the turkey. You'll remove the foil, and then for the last 35 to 40 minutes, the turkey needs to be basted with the remaining molasses mixture. You can also brush it with the drippings from the pan. This needs to be done every 10 to 15 minutes until all of the mixture is gone. Now that our bread has doubled in size, gently deflate the dough. This recipe makes two loaves of bread and it can make 24 dinner rolls. I only need 12, so I'll be baking the other half into a sandwich loaf for making turkey sandwiches this week. Divide the dough into 12 pieces and fold them into balls, pinching the bottoms closed. Arrange them in a 9 by 13 inch baking dish and cover it with a damp cloth. Let them rise until nearly doubled, about 40 minutes. Before baking, dust the rolls with flour and bake in a 350 degree oven for about 25 minutes. Before our garden breathed its final breath, I managed to get out and cut the last herbs for drying and make some fun dried floral arrangements to decorate with over the winter. This wreath is made with globe amaranth.
Well, this is the end of this episode, my dears. I hope that you enjoy these recipes and bringing a little taste of history to your holiday table. I will be cozying in this next week and continuing to store away our homegrown food like the little pack rat that I am. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to subscribe, that would bring so much joy to my heart. I hope that you all have a lovely week. I will be finishing up our seasonal magazine, which comes out on Monday, November 20th, along with our second volume of the Christmas Cookie ebook. I will see you here next Friday for another episode of historical cozy cooking in our prairie kitchen. I love you guys and have a great weekend.